Good afternoon. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching today's special conference online. Thank you so much for joining us. I would like to acknowledge the generous support of the underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors WBUR and the Boston Globe. This program is also funded in part by Mass Humanities, which receives support from the Mass Cultural Council and is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I would also like to thank Ellen Fitzpatrick, Professor of History at the University of New Hampshire for serving as an advisor in the development of this conference. Thank you also to our Kennedy Library Forum producer, Liz Murphy, and Director of Education and Public Programs, Nancy McCoy, for all their work putting this conference together. We look forward to a robust question and answer period today. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. We're so pleased you've joined us for this afternoon's keynote session of our special conference in commemoration of the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Expanding Democracy, the 19th Amendment and the Voting Rights Today. In the words of President Kennedy, the right to vote in a free American election is the most powerful and precious right in the world. As today's conversations have demonstrated, a continued focus on voting rights remains critical. We are so grateful to have this timely opportunity to explore the judicial role in contemporary voting rights issues with our distinguished guests. I'm now delighted to introduce this afternoon's speakers. Judge Nancy Gertner is a senior lecturer of law at Harvard Law School a former federal judge, and an instructor at Yale Law School. She was appointed to the bench in 1994 by President Clinton. She has written and spoken widely on various legal issues concerning civil rights, civil liberties, employment, criminal justice, and procedural issues throughout the US, Europe, and Asia. In 2008, she received the Thurgood Marshall Award from the American Bar Association section of individual rights and responsibilities. Only the second woman to receive it. Justice Ginsburg was the first. Her numerous awards also include the Massachusetts Bar Association's Hennessy Award for Judicial Excellence and the Margaret Brent Women's Lawyer of Achievement Award established by the ABA Commission on the Status of Women in the Profession. Chief Justice Margaret Marshall served for 11 years as Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. She was the first woman to hold that position in the court's more than 300 year history. During her 14 years on the Supreme Judicial Court, Chief Justice Marshall wrote numerous opinions, many of them groundbreaking. She is recognized as a champion for an independent judiciary and as a leader in the promotion of administrative reforms within the judicial branch and is a longtime advocate of access to justice for all. She currently serves as senior counsel at Choate Hall and Stewart, and as a senior research fellow and lecturer at Harvard Law School. Her numerous awards include the ABA Commission on Women in the Professions Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award, and the ABA's Pursuit of Justice Award, the Massachusetts Bar Association's Hennessy Award. I'm also so pleased to welcome Barbara Howard, our moderator for this evening's discussion to the library virtually. She is the former anchor of WGBH's All Things Considered. She is an award-winning anchor, reporter, writer, and producer with extensive local, national, and international experience. Before joining WGBH, Barbara worked several years for WBUR in Boston as an anchor, reporter, and editor. Her radio series, Liberation Remembered, received a Peabody Award, and her long-form work was included in the best of NPR. Barbara spent three years in Berlin, filing for NPR, BBC World News, and Marketplace, and later reported from China for KQED and Voice of America, while living for another three years in Beijing. She also served as an associate producer and audio producer for the landmark series Eyes on the Prize, presented on PBS by WGBH and later rebroadcast rebroadcast on American Experience. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Well, thank you so much, Alan. Uh, I'm Barbara Howard, in case you haven't figured that out. 
And I have to say, it's a, my honor to be having the opportunity to interview these distinguished judges. Uh, I have had the opportunity in the past to interview both Judge Nancy Gertner and Justice Margaret Marshall. And one uh, addendum I want to put in here about Justice Marshall, she's perhaps best known, I'm, I'm around these here parts in Massachusetts, for being the judge who wrote the decision that brought gay marriage, the first state of, to have gay marriage was Massachusetts. And so that's what she's perhaps best known for, but she has many other qualities, I'm sure, that are <laughs> more important than that. Um, but let's get right to it. We're talking here about expanding democracy, the 19th Amendment voting, uh, which extended uh, voting rights to women. It's 100 years since that passed. 50 years before that, there was the 15th Amendment, which brought about the vote for uh, freed black slaves, but only men, only men, among other things. So uh, a lot happened, though, that that didn't guarantee the right to vote because a lot of people were, were the vote was suppressed. Uh, particularly for people of color. Um, so now there is a sense that the rights are being restricted again. You know, what can the public or Congress do right now, uh, Justice, or I should say Chief Justice Marshall, uh, to help preserve those rights? Oops. Oh, you need to, I'm sorry, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get it. <laughs> Uh, it's a great pleasure to join you this afternoon and to join Judge uh, Gertner. It is extraordinary to me, I mean, the right to vote is fundamental to any democracy. We do not have a democracy unless you have a right to vote. And that means every person over a certain age. I mean, in the United States, now it means every person over the age, over a certain age, in theory. But we know, for example, that particularly with respect to black Americans, black men to begin with. It was black women, as we heard in the, the two wonderful programs you had that preceded this one, that black women fought for the suffrages. They were the real engines behind getting the women to vote. Since the passage of the 19th um, Amendment for 100 years, women have had the right to vote. And there hasn't been the concerted, there hasn't been the concerted attempt to keep women from voting, but there certainly has been a long and historical attempt to keep African Americans from voting. And I would say uh, more recently, in other words, and we can get into it later, in connection with the contemporary uh, system, in the wake of Bush against Gore, there has been an extraordinary attempt by the United States Supreme Court and other federal courts to interfere in the rights guaranteed to citizens of each state that their state legislatures will decide how and when uh, to conduct um, elections. So in short, I see it in sort of four big chunk chapters. Black men have a constitutional right to vote, but everything is done to block that. It's done by local rules, by all the kinds of um, um, roadblocks that your panel talked about this morning. Then you have- Like, that, like for, for example, polling taxes, literacy tests, things that, those things, but then the civil rights movement came along. Well, that's and, a long time after. So right. You, you go from there, you go to black women trying to get the right to vote, eventually women get the right to vote. Very, very few women get do vote. There's never any attempt to include women in the votes. And then all the way behind this is a suppression of the vote until you get to the Voting Rights Act. In the civil rights period. In the civil rights period. Then you get the United States Supreme Court striking those provisions down. I mean, we have been... That's, and that's, let's, let's get that, let's understand that, the chronology, because the, when you say the, the Supreme Court striking that down, are you talking about the seven years ago, what happened? Yes. Can you talk a little about, about that, that case? Well, that would, uh... You know, that was a case where there were challenges raised. I mean, the civil, Nancy will remind me of the date of the Voting Rights Act was what, 1964? 64. Yeah. So, you know, the Voting Rights Act really was a very serious attempt by Congress in, in a sort of major piece of legislation to look at and deal with and address and try to overcome the systematic attempts that had been made right across this country, but particularly in the southern states, to suppress the black vote. 
And it was a very powerful piece of legislation. It really was a most powerful piece of legislation. And then, Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sort of it proceeded with no real constitutional challenges to right. it right. until the uh, Shelby case. So maybe right. maybe Judge Gertner can pick it up there. Shelby case that was seven years ago. That was decided. Can talk talk about that. That well, first to understand that Voting Rights Act. One of the provisions, one of the strongest parts, was states that had a history of voter suppression had to go to the federal federal authorities to get permission to change any of their programs or changing any other policy in terms of the vote. And so that was in place for these years, and it's been pretty you know, pretty successful by all accounts. But seven years ago, we had Shelby versus the Attorney General of the United States, Shelby County, Alabama versus the AG. Talk about that a little bit, would you, Judge Gertner? Well, the the, the requirement of pre-clearance was built on a history of discrimination against African Americans in particular Southern states. It wasn't an abstraction. There had been that history. And the reason for preclearance, which we have really seen now in this election, is that if you don't deal with these issues before they're implemented, pre-clear changes to the election, then they are raised in a much more scattershot and difficult way in the months going coming up to an election. It becomes a much more fraught conversation because now it's a it's a challenge to the rules, having in mind what the elections are going to be. The Supreme Court, uh, in a really an extraordinary uh, decision, um, with which I and others soundly disagree, uh, held that the ple that the preclearance requirement was no longer necessary. That you know the, there hadn't been a problem in years, and therefore we don't need it anymore. It was the subject of a fabulous Ruth Bader Ginsburg dissent. Um, uh, which said, this is like saying, uh, I no longer need my umbrella when it's raining because I haven't gotten wet. Uh, I mean, and in some sense, it has been a prescient comment that she made. Um, if you look at what has happened in Florida, for example, when the referendum of the state referendum restores the right to vote for people who had been convicted of a felony. And then the state legislature, the, the state legislature decides, well, that's okay. Except in, when they have to have completed their term of imprisonment, which makes perfect sense. But in addition, they have to have paid all fees uh, attendant on their conviction. As it turns out, the state of Florida has absolutely no idea who owes what. And in fact, under one study, they wouldn't be able to figure out who owes what until the 2030s, given the, the, the nature of their records. In addition, requiring as a condition of voting that you pay your fee for court costs, court costs is a poll tax. But notwithstanding that, the courts have actually rejected challenges to this requirement that felons had to have paid their fees, uh, uh, which is as a prerequisite to voting again, which is just an indication of the ways in which current litigation prior to an election or in the context of an election with where is is just fraught which is why the pre-clearance requirement was so important well let me see if i can summarize from what you're saying so we're talking about the civil rights movement the voting rights act in 64 as a result of seeing severe voter repression we're talking about you know the freedom rides and people trying to register people to vote in the south back in the mid 60s you know shorn or cheney and goodman getting killed you know uh, young recruits who went down there trying to get people registered that all resulted put a lot of pressure on the legislatures there was no denying seeing what was going on and so along comes lyndon baines johnson he signs the voting rights act the voting rights act then does what it's supposed to for all these years and then seven years ago in 2013 you had justice roberts who wrote the majority opinion as opposed to the one you just cited that ruth bader ginsburg uh summarized <laughs> in her position but it, when, when he did his opinion i recall that he said and i think it was brought up earlier today that he talked about not states rights but state sovereignty and that was shocking to some people because the whole notion that states could go their own way in a federal election what do you make of that, Judge Gertner? Well, the, the 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 implication of state sovereignty was to some degree what had justified the Jim Crow laws, 
we have a right to run our state in any way that we like um, and, and cast doubt on the whole notion of a federal structure of rights. We needed a federal structure of rights precisely because the states were not enforcing federal constitutional rights. Um, and, and, and that's why, and that's why, when you look at the whole idea of interstate bus transport during the civil rights movement, if people don't understand why were people riding buses, it seems so abstract. You saw the sheriffs bludgeoning them and jailing them. But the whole notion of that was instead of taking the local buses, that's a Montgomery bo bus boycott, a different thing. But we're talking about the interstate Greyhound buses right. crossing state lines becomes a federal question, right. and that's why that's why those buses were used then to help push the legislation forward. Right. I think that it may be hard for the listeners who are not deeply steeped, you know, in the constitutional history. Um, I think as a country, we have been very, found it very challenging uh, to come to terms with our history um, regarding um, African Americans in particular in the United States. And to me, Shelby against um, Attorney General Holder, so it's often referred to as Shelby against Holder, uh, Eric Holder was the Attorney General at the time, is another example, as Nancy so clearly stated, of saying, well, all of that was in the past. It's all fine now. We're an equal society. These states, look, they have African-American governors and they have African-American congressmen you know, like Congressman John Lewis. And, you know, that was then, now is now. I think what we have seen with, uh, with piercing clarity in the last several months, um, in particular, uh, and not just the murder of John, uh, George Floyd, but also the um, University of Virginia um, protests that involved, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, but I think we have seen with piercing clarity that we are not beyond that period. Then was not just then, it is now. And so how the courts, which is what Nancy and I are mostly looking at, are dealing with the right to vote, the right to vote that is so fundamental. There was a long struggle to get into our constitution the right for every single adult person to vote. And it seems to me that we keep chipping, 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 and constantly trying to push it back, which has a particular impact, not entirely, a particular impact on African Americans. So for example, many states have said that somebody who has been convicted of a felony can never vote again. Now that of course applies to every felon, everybody convicted of a felony, um, but it has a particularly powerful impact on African Americans because we know that a disproportionate number of African Americans are sentenced or convicted of felonies um, based on their race. So there's, the, the, the question is of which moment of our history are we looking at access to the right to vote and everything that goes with it. Um, and I think we were at a moment now where it is a continuation of an attempt to suppress the African-American vote, but we now seem to be seeing signs of, most recently this past week, attempts by the United States Federal Court to interfere with how states are running their elections. And with much regret, the perception is that it's because using mail-in ballots are more favorable to one party than the other. So let me explain what I just said. The United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 4, so that's right up there, the beginning of our Constitution, the original Constitution says, the time, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature of that state. So you have a right to vote. No state legislature can take away your right to vote. 
but each state legislature decides when, how, how many polling places you're going to have, or you're going to be open from these hours, how many poll watchers you have, so on and so forth. That's always been a state, um, a state issue. When the federal Supreme Court stepped in with Bush against Gore, that was the election where the United States Supreme Court decided that the Florida Supreme Court, which had allowed the counting of the ballots between then candidate Gore and candidate Bush to continue, was somehow inappropriate and the Supreme Court needs to step in. That was the first occasion, I think, Nancy, that the United States Supreme Court had ever tried to interfere with how a state was conducting its way of electing a senator, representatives, and presidents. Now, why is that important? It is important because that particular case, the issue was not race. In other words, it was an intervention of the federal courts into what had hitherto for been entirely controlled by state legislatures and state courts. My court, for example, the Supreme Judicial Court, quite often got questions relating to state elections and to federal elections, and we decided them. That's what the Constitution says. Um, and but Bush against Gore changed that. Now, in the, in the majority opinion, or the, the, the most majority opinion, the court says, this is a one-off. This is unusual. This is very unusual. So we wouldn't normally be doing this. And Nancy will know that there is no such thing as a one-off in our system of justice. It's a precedent, and you can go back to it. Well, that, that almost no one has cited Bush v. Gore except Justice Kavanaugh yesterday. Just, well, uh, you know, for the most part. But that is inside baseball. This is not... How about it's a little bit, it's a little bit too inside baseball, unless you want to explain it quickly. But um, I do have a few questions, though, from some of the people who are tuned in. You know, one is, is it feasible to correct the Voting Rights Act? And was it 64, 65? I, one was a civil rights. Six, okay. Yeah. Is it is it possible to bring it back? I mean, we're seeing a lot besides the example you gave, Judge Gertner. You know, we're seeing just yesterday what happened in Wisconsin, um, where... Your, your vote has to arrive on November 3rd. Doesn't right. postmarking it by then doesn't work. We're right. seeing, you know, we're seeing indigenous people who have nothing but post office boxes for addresses. Their votes, they're being taken off the voting rolls uh, on a technicality because they don't have a street address. We're seeing a lot of ways that that states are are clamping down. That as as uh, as Chief Justice uh, Marshall said, on people who aren't necessarily white women. I well, I mean, there's no need. We certainly could amend the law to reintroduce preclearance to so long as the legislature, the Congress did so with fi with to findings of today. In other words, there's nothing necessary. I, I don't believe that there's anything in Roberts's decision that would suggest if there was a record that said, you know what, guys, it's still going on, that that wouldn't, that would not prevent uh, having a preclearance rule. But you're talking about something that is much more endemic it's not just uh, efforts to block the African-American vote. What we've seen is efforts to block all votes. Um, the, the, I mean, this, the extraordinary statement that the president made that, you know, conceding that mail-in ballots are more likely to be Democrats because Democrats were more likely to be taking the virus more seriously. So there's been efforts to deal with particular kinds of voting, which we've really never seen before. And so preclearance would have to preclearance would have there would have to be hearings and findings so that we could make sure that this doesn't happen again. Let me just say one thing, you know, um, I spent a fair amount of time in Australia, and I know that this is sort of antithetical to the American way, but voting is mandatory in Australia. Uh, voting is mandatory. You get should, if you don't vote. Should people have the day off? That's been raised. That's right. I mean. You think about, even if it's a question, it's almost as there's a continuum here. There's, you know, overtly uh, blocking voting. Um, there is then not making it easy. And what you're talking about is what are the steps to make it easy? 
I mean, I think there's a third step, Nancy, it's blocking, not making it easy. And then even when you do vote, making sure that your vote doesn't count. Yes. I mean, and I think that's the period. So if we're talking over, if that's the period in which we are at the moment, if we're talking over law about voting, we cannot ignore the specific attempts to block African-American votes. That is a powerful part of our history. A powerful part of our history was was stopping women from having the right to vote. It took women, African-American and non-African-American women, going to prison. Uh, people forget that Susan B. Anthony was indicted and convicted in the federal court for attempting to vote. Under the 14th Amendment. Under Before the 19th, 19th Amendment, she said, this, the, the language of the 14th Amendment is general, it talks about you know citizens it, have the right to vote. I, women have always been citizens, I'm gonna vote. It's actually a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story, and she served time in prison. So, so there has been huge historical movement to get the vote, and then there's been a massive sort of backlash to push it back again, keep pushing it back again. If you think of the period in which we're living at the moment, and I'm not making a particular gender point, but mail-in ballots are essential at this particular time because of the coronavirus pandemic. There are people who, who can't get out, who can't get, who can't go and wait in, you know, long lines of polling. Although, um, if I could just stop here for one minute, Barbara, you know, Nancy spent time in Australia. I grew up in South Africa. Many people watching this wonderful program that the Kennedy Library has done will may not remember, but when the um, when President Mandela was first, when the election that resulted in the election of President Nelson Mandela, we can all remember those snake lines of thousands of people waiting patiently uh, to vote. You can imagine my feeling when I saw in this country, my adopted country, thousands of people lining up to vote even in circumstances where we know that they are vulnerable because of that pandemic. It was very moving. People want to vote. People have the right to vote. Any democracy should be making it as easy as possible for every person, however we decide, the adult aged, 18, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 21, every country can decide for itself. Whether we go so far, Nancy, is to say you have to you are forced to vote. I don't think that's going to go down. I, <laughs> I, I must ask, though, Chief Justice Marshall, do you think that this uh, sense of vote, the vote being suppressed this time is actually motivating people? That's why you're seeing longer lines? I think there has been sufficient concern. I mean, look, this is, I read the same news from, I, I read a very wide spectrum of news. And you, you notice I use the word read. I, I tend to read. Um, but I do read a very wide spectrum of views, left to right all over. And I think that there has been a sense that if you simply mail your ballot, um, it may not, quote, get there on time. Now, this leads us to the question that uh, Judge Gertner just mentioned about what the United States Supreme Court did this week. Because many states, have a requirement that say you have to have your mail-in ballot postmarked, postmarked before the day of election. And then, you know, it takes the post office typically one or two or three days. And, and so it hardly has delayed elections in the past. At the moment, states are trying to figure out how to deal with the coronavirus pandemic and they've dealt with them in different ways. That's what the Constitution says they can do. So in Massachusetts, you do it this way. Uh, Wisconsin, you do it another way. But with Wisconsin, that's that brings us to the, the judges, especially the judges in the lower court. There have been a lot of appointments made under this Trump administration. We are all, we've heard, of course, about the most recent Supreme Court justice, you know, Amy, uh, Amy Barrett. But my question is, is it the lower court just 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 uh, appointments in the lower courts that are, that are 
pushing these cases forward, especially in places like Wisconsin. I'm not sure what who was who made that judgment about must be there by. No, it was a federal district court judge in Wisconsin that said okay. that essentially the state deadlines can be extended because of COVID. Um, in other words, it's a national emergency, emergency. It's unique. It doesn't, it's not likely to repeat and that it's okay to extend it. And the Supreme but that Court- wasn't, But that wasn't upheld by the Supreme Court. That's right. In other words, it went up the line. The Supreme Court just then had said, you know, you, fe- it was actually a troubling decision because it said to the federal court, you know, this is a state matter. You federal court don't know about the nuances of the of the state matter. You shouldn't be meddling in state matters, number one. And number two, not so close to an election. Well, unfortunately, COVID came close to an election. So that was a deadline we sort of couldn't stop. But more significant, which is what Mar- Judge Justice Marshall and I were just talking about, more significant, the question of the federal power to deal with state decisions is fraught here. So Kavanaugh was saying, Justice Kavanaugh was saying, no federal power, federal court went too far in changing state deadlines. But there's a footnote that only nerds read. Actually, no, journalists have read it as well, in which he said, well, of course, a federal court can interfere with the state deadlines, but federal courts can interfere with state legislative decisions citing Bush v. Gore. Now that, first of all, it makes almost no sense at all. If it's a federalism issue, it doesn't matter, it's a state court or or a state legislature. But that's a very pregnant footnote because it says, you know what? Down the line, we may see federal courts interfering, not so much in the election, but the determination of who the electors are in the electoral college is a state legislative decision. There may be contests about it after the vote on November 3rd. And what is scary about the footnote is, is he suggesting that the federal courts would intervene with the state legislative process concerning electors? Yeah, which does which does take us to November 3rd. And there's a lot of question. You know, it's been pretty clear from the White House that there might be a challenge, at least on that side. Um, all eyes have now shifted to the Supreme Court with the appointment of, of Amy Coney Barrett. Um, now there's a six to three conservative majority on the court. And uh, there's a, been a question about whether she should recuse herself having just been a, appointed. Um, Judge Gertner, what is your thinking on that? Um, do we have enough time? No. Um, um, uh, I think she clearly should recuse herself, but the problem is it recuses herself for two reasons. There is an appearance of impropriety issue, not even the, the reality of it. What's the appearance of impropriety? Our president said, I want nine justices in before the election. Why would that matter? And so there's an appearance that she was put there for the purpose of putting her thumb on the scale. And that is a very troubling Thing. And that alone should make her say, I shouldn't be involved in this case. The problem is that the Supreme Court has no rules with respect to recusal. Other judges do, but the Supreme Court has no rules with respect to recusal. And that, so when, when depending upon the results of this election, there are those who believe, and I'm among them, that there really should be a commission formed to look at our Supreme Court and to look at other Supreme Courts around the world and why it is that we have essentially a Supreme Court with rules that that apply nowhere else. Other courts have retirement ages. Sadly, Marky Marshall had to retire, uh, or actually you did before your retirement age. Uh, You know, other courts have uh, terms. Other courts have, other Supreme Courts have rotating positions. You stay on the Supreme Court for a while, then you rotate to other other um, courts. Other courts have conflict of interest rules. Other courts have recusal rules. I mean, this, the institution ought to have been re-examined. And un- unfortunately, it's gonna, the re-examination is going to take place in a way that it looks so, par- so um, partisan. But scholars have talked about this for the longest time. 
Well, you know, one of an earlier comment uh, came in for one of the earlier panels. Someone asked, you know, if the Supreme Court is made up of originalists like the ones appointed by Trump, does it give an aggrieved party a chance to to win? Does it give does it give which party? Well, the, a party who brings issues like voting rights questions, you know, challenges where they feel that they're they've been suppressed from voting. Does it give them a chance um, on that? Well, if, for, I mean, it, it's a reasonable position. Um, originalists, you know, the first one of the most prominent originalists was the author of the Dred Scott decision, who was the judge who, who did the justice rather, who determined that it was not unconstitutional for African Americans to be property. And that was because the Constitution, the we the people under the Constitution, did not include slaves as full participants in the democracy, at, nor women, nor people without property. So, Originalism raises serious questions about the, its application to a diverse, heterogeneous American community. Well, and 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 uh, Chief Justice uh, Marshall, the, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Gin, Ginsburg, made a point of the idea that the Constitution is a living, breathing, evolving, maybe even document. Um, it, the the branches of government seem a little out of kilter right now to many people. Uh, is that troubling to you in terms of people having confidence in our systems? I, th I think I think there are many pieces of our government um, in the executive branch, the legislative branch, and and sadly now the United States Supreme Court that people are losing confidence. But let me take an example of originalism, and um, Nancy's chosen a powerful one, the Dred Scott decision. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, who has been receiving accolades from everyone, including um, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Justice Ginsburg, when she was a lawyer, brought cases under the uh, 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution which does not specify anything about gender. And before she brought the first important case, uh, the United States Supreme Court had ruled repeatedly that the equal protection provision of the 14th Amendment did not apply to women. And in fact, there's nothing about women. And if you look at the original intent, I don't know if Nancy would agree with me, but I think it is very doubtful that they were thinking about women at that time. It was clear they weren't thinking about right. women at that time. Here's Justice Amy Coney Barrett saying how much she admires Justice Ginsburg, how Justice Ginsburg was a pathbreaker, how Justice Ginsburg had changed the way you know, women could function in society, and Justice Ginsburg did that as an advocate because she persuaded the United States Supreme Court that originalism was not the way to interpret that provision. That is what's so extraordinary. So that my own feeling is you can use originalism when it suits your political purpose. I think that is what we Americans are seeing and that is what is disheartening to us because that makes us feel that you just pick your theory when you want to pick your theory. I or think- your conclusion. Or you, um, anyone you, who reads anything about- Your theory it, is your conclusion. Yeah. When you pick your conclusion, then you bite those right. theory. And you justify it as the original intent. Anyone who reads anything about the American Constitution, the formation of the American Constitution, understands that it was sausage making. That essentially, um, uh, they put in. The, it was written in general language precisely because there were subgroups that really wanted one kind of country and subgroups that wanted another kind of country, and the language was intended to satisfy everyone. Which meant that it, there really is a very ambiguous original intent with respect to much of it. And all constitutions are sausage making. I mean, I, you know, I watched most closely the making of the great constitution, the sausage making constitution of South Africa, and people are now saying, oh, if only we thought about that, we would have done it differently. Sure. Then, now, we're getting we're getting quite a few questions coming through. And, and I, and I want to ask you this. What's what's on the court docket? 
coming up, the Supreme Court. There's a lot on it, including, of course, one that will resonate, I'm sure, with you, Chief Justice Marshall, which has to do with gay marriage. You know, the whole issue of um, gay rights, foster foster families being able to be gay, uh, couples bringing in foster kids is being challenged in Pennsylvania, I believe. There, there's a lot on immigration rights, there's uh, abortion rights. There's a whole lot of things coming up. Which ones, starting with you, Judge Marshall, are of greatest concern? <laughs> The one thing that we know in this country, especially if you sit on a court of last resort, but also, you know, if you were a, a trial judge, is we bring everything to court. So everything is always on the docket at any given time. But I could make a particular, there's so many serious ones. I could pick any, but let me just give you one example. Well, before, I'm sorry, I should have also mentioned the Affordable Care Act. That's of the big course. one. But let, yes. let me just talk about the gay marriage decision because I am, as, as you suggested, so closely associated with it. Uh, very close friends of mine who were married, two men, called me up um, the day, um, uh, you know, on a day and said, you know, what do, what do you think is going to happen on the United States, uh, United States Supreme Court? Is our marriage at risk? And I said, honestly, which I felt at that moment, I don't think your marriage is at risk. In other words, I didn't mean their particular marriage, but marriage is not at risk because the United States Supreme Court has recognized it as a fundamental right, and, and, and I don't think that's at risk. But I think you're going to find taking big chunks out around the corners, like wedding cakes and foster children. I do not mean to suggest that those are the same categories, but they will find there will be there will, methods to cut back will be found. Then I read the concurring decision of Justice Thomas. And it'll take me a minute to explain what happened in this case. This was a case that came to the United States Supreme Court about a woman in a state who was authorized, she was the person who was supposed to issue marriage licenses. A gay couple okay. went to get their marriage license issue, issued. And she said, I don't believe in gay marriage. I, I'm not gonna issue you a license. Well, if you're a public official, you don't get to choose. If the law says the couple has a right to issue a license, you get an issue a license. In any event, she was indicted, convicted, and sentenced to prison. There was a challenge to that conviction. You with me? That's the one that came up to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court decided two weeks ago, 10 days ago, that in fact, it would not take that case. The United States Supreme Court has the ability to choose which cases it takes. It said, we're not gonna take that case. Justice Thomas wrote a concurring opinion. He agreed that the court should not take the case, but he then wrote an extraordinary um, concurring opinion that said, well, I'm not going to call it a screed, as he wrote a concurring opinion, and you could go all the way through it, but right at the end it said, the court made this mess, the court can undo the mess. Now, there have been debates about precedent, there have been debates about when it is it appropriate to overturn a precedent? But the notion that so few years after a major decision of the United States Supreme Court that involves a fundamental right, as articulated by the court, should now be being put on the chopping block by one of the justices, I think that is extraordinary. Chief Justice Roberts, whatever his views, you simply cannot run a court of last resort of a nation of our size with the millions of people who live in this country, with the diversity of opinions, if you could just you know, depend who gets into court first, who gets into court first, and the next judge just comes and overturns it and overrules it. I mean, we the whole point about precedence is that it settles the law. So people know how to how to fashion their behavior. And I think when you asked us earlier, are people losing confidence? I think we, we are losing confidence. And that is 
um, that is so troubling to me in particular because this nation has been revered, you know, for its system of having a justice system that was admired in so many parts of the world. Well, you, you know, it, it did take a constitutional amendment. I'm getting a question here. It took a constitutional amendment to get African Americans and women the right to vote. Do we need to think about passing some new constitutional amendments? And Judge Gertner, in what areas would you think? The problem with the constitutional amendment is there are two ways of amending a con the constitution. One is proposing an amendment and going through the state legislatures, and the other is calling a constitutional convention. Constitutional convention makes the entire constitution up for grabs. And in these divided times, it's not something that anyone would do. Even the state by state alternative legitimizes the amending process, and you're going to wind up with competing amendments. Um, that's the danger. Um, the, one of the reasons why the original constitution has lasted as long as it has is because we really have not fundamentally messed with its structure. And even the suggestions I'm making on the Supreme Court are ancillary, are, are, are not fundamentally, the structure of the number of judge, justices is not in the constitution. Uh, that actually has been by statute. So the, it, there, the line, the notion that we should mess with things that are not in the constitution that we can address by statute makes sense only because if we put it all up for grabs in these very fraught times, who knows where that will go? So that's not a recommended way. I do think it is a recommended way. Okay. <laughs> There's maybe one time that Nancy and I, so let me, let me just explain. The United States Constitution has not been amended many times in its 200 and plus year history, but it has been important to amend it. I think there is a very important amendment concerning the United States Supreme Court that can be done only by a constitutional amendment. The constitutional amendment provides that judges, uh, the, the constitution provides that judges serve for life subject to good behavior. That is what Massachusetts had. And that's all federal judges. Massachusetts uh, changed its constitution, the good citizens of Massachusetts, to now require mandatory retirement at age 70. As Nancy pointed out before, there is not another uh, country, the, the, the French court is, a, is a, an exception that's irrelevant to this discussion, but that doesn't have what I would term a, a single lengthy term. You either serve for a single number of years, 20 years, for example, or to an age. At the time the Constitution was adopted, the average age life expectancy was about 48 years. Now it's far higher than that. And part of what we see happening on the United States Constitution is that there's no, that it becomes um, almost arbitrary as to when a justice will leave. Age, how old was Justice Stevens? 93, whether you die, whether you're waiting for somebody. And so scholars, jurists, people who've looked at this on all sides of the political spectrum have decided that you need a single lengthy term. That's what everybody else has. Why a single lengthy term? That's how you maintain the independence of the judiciary because you're not then looking over your shoulder as to whether or not you're gonna be reappointed. The appeal, the in intermediate appellate courts and the trial court in which Nancy served, Judge Gertner served, have solved this in a way by creating something they call senior status, which means that if a sitting federal judge wants to take, quote, senior status, Congress automatically authorizes another judgeship to fill that position and the senior judge can continue to sit. You can't do that for the United States Supreme Court. The only way, I mean, there've been th thoughts about how perhaps you could get around the constitution serve for life. I know all about those. You're gonna need a constitutional amendment. Well, I don't wanna to get too much in the weeds on the <laughs> mechanics of the judicial. I understand right. what you're, you're getting, but you know, people are very, very concerned, not only about, you know, some of the, about the 
diversity that is shot down by the by the long uh, judgeships that people have and and um, the diversity of the country is reflected necessarily in the judiciary and there's some concerns being raised and questions about that which is of course fueled more by people staying on the bench maybe sometimes a little too long um, now there are questions too about should things be be should p things be done on the state level to help offset what might be coming down from the Supreme Court that we now have in place there are things that can be done on a statewide level can you talk about them please yes uh, let me start with you I, I can see you uh judge marshall well you know both of us can talk about it we have a okay well then then let me let me let uh, judge gertner start this one then okay so there was there are state constitutions and in fact our constitution as as justice marshall knows predates the federal constitution in the uh, uh in particular in the 1980s the state supreme judicial court Inter began to interpret the state constitution in ways that were different than comparable, not identical, but comparable provisions of the federal constitution. The state Supreme Judicial Court uh, declared the death penalty unconstitutional under the Massachusetts constitution, uh, situated the right to choose abortion under the state constitution, um, inconsistent with what the federal constitution did. I mean, it, it strongly under the state constitution. So even if Roe v. Wade is overturned, the state protections will remain. Justice Marshall wrote the decision on gay marriage long before the federal government interpreted its own. The federal, the Supreme Court interpreted its own uh, its own constitution to require it. So that even if Justice Thomas gets his way and the gay marriage decision is overturned, Justice Marshall's extraordinary decision will stand. We've seen that in numbers of areas. In fact, um, I want to, I'm in the middle of an op-ed now directed to just to Governor Baker to say to him that his, there are two vacancies on the Supreme Judicial Court that could not have been more important than now because the people he picks hopefully independent-minded, hopefully of the caliber of a Margie Marshall, um, will help us protect Massachusetts in the light of uh, what, in my view, is a reactionary majority on the Supreme, on the Supreme Court. So yes, the, the state legislatures can do uh, a great deal, and state courts can do a great deal. But when you step back, we're a country. And well, I was going to ask about that. Because then you have a patchwork, like it was before Roe versus Wade, when you had women having to travel across state lines to get an abortion, and that we'd return to that. Now, that is that would be so for things like that. The question, though, I'm wondering about when it's a federal election, like the one we're running into, when you've got uh, two men running for president, why is it that the state gets to determine who votes, essentially, on the state level, when it's a federal decision being made? of so the Constitution. The Constitution. I'm sorry, I, I, I should be more directing. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. You don't get to, who votes. I mean, you have the right to vote. It's whether or not your ballot will be counted. That is well, that's what I'm talking about. The individual states are still are still very powerful in the federal level there. Well, under, right. Of course, the that's what the United States Constitution says. It says, this, that's why I keep holding up the Constitution, which Nancy also carries around in her pocket. <laughs> <laughs> the times and places and manner. So it, it it is what our federal system is. As Nancy says, we we think we are a national country and it drives us crazy sometimes when um, people do it differently in one part of the country and another, but there's an enormous strength in that as well. For one, um, well, let me, before you get into those, I just want to know, but on a federal level, I would keep coming back to this, sorry, but is there a way to have a federal standard when it when it's a national election, not on the state level for state local local uh, candidates, but why is it that some votes have more sway than others, depending on the state you're in, depending on who your elect, election officials are? That was right. That's just because it's in the Constitution is what you're saying. Well, no, because, no, because the, the, um, the Constitution also provides that Congress, that Congress, that's a federal Congress, may at any time by law make or alter whatever regulations the states have. So first, you've got to go to Congress to do it. 
The second of all, and, and, and this, again, all of these things are to some extent, Barbara, a little in the weeds, but that's the way our constitution is complicated. But think of it this way. Let's assume that there was a federal law that said all the ballots have to be, uh, all, all the ballots can um, be counted for 10 days um, after the date of election, assuming that Congress could get its act together to do a federal national law like that. Um, and then the states would do it differently. Generally speaking, we like to have everybody on the ballot at the same time, federal, state, school committee, uh, your, your local representatives, whoever it is, go on one ballot. Um, and so they, so I understand that 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 makes a lot of sense. We only have a couple of minutes left, and I do want to ask, you know, because this question seems to be a recurring theme. What can the average person do in their in their communities to help preserve and expand the right to vote, to protect the right to vote? What should people be doing? People are very troubled by this election. People should be voting as early as they can in a way that most secures their vote. This is not this is an audience that's not not addressed to Massachusetts. This is right across the nation. Well, we're a little bit we're almost a little late for that. And and Judge Gertner, I ask you the same question because it's if you haven't voted uh, by mailing it in, it's getting a little late. You better get get to the mailbox quick. <laughs> or or drop it in your drop box. But but what can the average person be doing? At this stage, to ensure to to you know to capture back the confidence we've had in the systems in the country. Well, before this election, there certainly there are phone lines to help people uh, um, to, to help people know where to vote and when to vote. I mean, so that is that is one thing. It's getting it's getting pretty close, but to let people know in your community where they can vote and help them sort things out. Friends of mine who were doing. Uh, but going, going forward beyond beyond next Tuesday. Well, I, I, I want to disagree with, with Justice Marshall. The, in fact, the, the, the federal stu structure, on the one hand, the Constitution says that, um, uh, the, the, says that there shall be an electoral college and specifies the number of electors. There's then a federal statute which talks about how to count the electoral college and what happens when, uh, if there's a tie in the electoral college. So there is a mixed federal state responsibility there. And it seems to me there could be legislation that would address some of these issues more directly in the same way that they addressed it in the Voting Rights Act. So that is something that people should do. And you want to do that on the federal level. Um, Absolutely. For the presidency, that's where the action is. Well, I want to thank you both so much for being here. <laughs> Very interesting discussion. I'm sure we'll be taken to a lot of dinner tables tonight. Uh, we've been listening to Judge Nancy Gertner and uh, and the Chief Justice Mar uh, Margaret Marshall. Uh, you, this is a special event put on by the Kennedy Library. It's, of course, because of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which which, uh, which didn't guarantee, but granted the right to vote to women. I'm Barbara Howard, and now I'm going to return it, I guess, to Rachel. Thank you so much, Barbara. And I'm sorry to cut this conversation short. It seems like we could have um, used another hour or so. Um, I am Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. And I want to just thank you so much, Judge Gertner, Chief Justice Marshall, and Barbara for this remarkable and thought-provoking conversation. I know if we were together on Columbia Point, which I wish we were, um, that the audience would share in my enthusiasm with a standing ovation for you all. <laughs> but since we don't have that opportunity, I will say that as a daughter of Massachusetts, um, Chief Justice Marshall and Judge Gertner, you are both personal heroes of mine, and it was a real honor to have you close out this special conference, Expanding Democracy, the 19th Amendment, and Voting Rights Today, commemorating the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And many thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon and throughout the day. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, we have just been so delighted to have you take part in these discussions. In the words of President Kennedy, the power of the ballot has enabled those who achieve it to win other achievements as well, to gain a full voice in the affairs of the, their state and nation, and to see their interests represented in the governmental bodies which affect their future. We certainly saw this idea reflected in the rich and fascinating discussions just now and throughout this conference. 
And of course, we've also heard how much work remains to ensure the enfranchisement of all voters in this country. These exceptional conversations will be on our website, and we hope that you will revisit them and share them with your colleagues and friends. Most importantly, we hope that these discussions inspire you to continue to exercise your right to vote. Thank you again for joining us today.